Uh, thank you, Avi. Thanks for being here. Uh, so this is going to be a very quick overview, very superficial talk about the sort of thing I've been doing uh, with my friends. Uh, it's mostly about dynamic networks, but if I have time, I'll also talk about equilibrium. Uh, so let's get started with the model organism in this line of work, which is the Hexenman quasi systems. So actually, it does bear on the election because uh, this is a model that political scientists like to to study, where there are people we call agents, and, and then we put them on a the map like this: left, right, authoritarian, libertarian. I let you guess where Trump is on that graph. And um, the premise of the model is the following: it's that. Uh, People evolve their opinions, not so much as a function of who they listen to, but as a function of who they listen to, that who share common opinions. So you pay attention to the people who think like you, and you totally discard the opinions of people who are completely different. That's the model, okay. Uh, which means that if uh, these are the points of the agents, uh, then each agent has a radius of influence. These are the people she's going to be listening to three people. And then what's going to happen is that person over here is going to move to the mass center of all four. OK, so this thing moves to the mass center. That's the model. Uh, this thing moves to the center of gravity of these four guys. That's the model. And you do this for everybody. Now, the other agents may have a different uh, radius. Uh, some may have a big disk. Others may have a very small disk, depending <coughs> on their uh, you know, thoughts. But anyway, that's the model. And that's in, uh, not necessarily in the plane, in the high dimensions. Yeah, this is typically in very high dimensions. But I, we'll see uh, things are just as hard in one dimension. Um, so you get a pretty picture like this. Uh, and then you can iterate forever and see what happens. So remember, each agent is associated with a radius. That's the only information really that you have. And then you have the starting configuration. And then everybody will move to the mass center of the other points. This is, this is not a great example because there are too few agents. But you can imagine there'd be lots of agents in here. And, and this guy will move to the center of gravity. What happens? Well, nobody knows. That's the sad story. Uh, simulations show that this always converges to a fixed point. But somehow, we have not been able to prove that. So anyway, that's the model. And um, now when all the radii are the same, we can do things. Uh, because you see, w when that happens, the graph is symmetric, obviously, because they have the same radius. So, uh, so good things happen. So this is a simulation, 20,000 agents kind of uniformly distributed, some kind of random uh, Poisson process. And then you just see what happens. And you have this kind of nice phase transition. Uh, you know, the symmetry gets broken in the obvious way, because I mean, do expect these clusters of things that will form at certain distances. What, what yeah. happens to people who are at extreme points of the convex house? Don't they? They will move in. Thing? Yeah. They will be pulled in. Yeah, so wouldn't they be pulled in? Up to a point. At some point, they're no longer pulled in, because they will be, the graph will be disconnected. Yeah. That, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um, now let's look in one dimension. The only problem with one dimension is that it's harder to draw pictures. Uh, two dimensions is great for that. Uh, but again, just in case you uh, didn't pay attention, this is the model. So uh, you have <coughs> n agents, and they have a position. I agent is at position x i of t at time t, and what happens is. It moves, it's a dynamical system. So this is the agent right here. It has this interval r. So it looks at the agents to its left by distance of r and to its right by distance of r. And then it moves to the mass, it moves to the average. OK, this is. And, um, and this goes on forever. So with, with Mark and our other Princeton collaborators, we prove an upper bound of n cube on that. Before, n cube is the time, an upper bound on the time it takes for the system to actually freeze completely. So it's, it's not just a fixed point. It's, it will actually freeze and just stop completely. Okay? And then these people show actually a lower bound of n squared 
In practice, it's extremely fast. When you do simulations, it's like instantaneous. Uh, but you can, you know, there are pathological cases where, where things are more complicated. Now, what happens when you relax this model? When, when you change anything, so, so, like for, so, so, yeah. Uh, freezing means that the, all the pairwise distances are bigger than now. Exactly, or zero. But yeah, they co yeah. some collapse. Yeah, exactly, so that's, that's called, you know, if it's only one, then that's co called consensus. They're all at the same, and otherwise it's polarization. You have these clusters then. Yeah. In the two-dimensional case, is that a theorem that you had, that you showed up there? It was a, in two slides before, so. I haven't shown any theorem yet, okay. so, so maybe I'll get to the theorems. Yeah. But right now, I have not claimed any theorem. Yeah, this looks more like lines. Yeah, but there are lots of points here. Constant, there were, you know, there, there were 20,000 points earlier, 20,000. So they have to be somewhere. So, so they're there. Uh, but is that, is that frozen? Uh, yeah, it will be frozen. It will be frozen? Frozen. It will not move. I mean, even if you have a big microscope, it will not move. Yes. Uh, but but when, when the radii are different, that, that it does not freeze. This will be asymptotic. Um, okay, so now what if we change <coughs> the model just to make it a tiny bit more complicated? So, you know, then what happens? So, for example, suppose that there are what's, what's called stubborn agents. So these are the blue agents. They never move. They're, 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 they're fixed to the ground. They're not allowed to move. And the others do just what they did before. What happens? So that was open. So we proved that actually it converges. And to do that, we consider s s uh, something slightly more general, which says the following. It says, well, take the old model. The old model says that you have to move to the mass center, wherever it is. Let's relax this and say that you have to move anywhere you want between your current position and the mass center. So I don't force you to move all the way to the mass center. You're giving a little interval, typically, and you can move anywhere you want. So in particular, you see, this will include the case of stubborn agents, because if you want to have some agents that are fixed once and for all, then you, you, you simply, you know, th they will not move. They will simply say, okay, I know I'm allowed to move over here, but I'd rather not move, so I just stay fixed. So that means that th the case of fixed agents, of stubborn agents, is a, is a subcase of this, all right? And, and this is highly non-deterministic. I mean, at any step, these numbers can be anything you want. So we show that this converges, we is Chu Wang, of uh, former students of mine, uh, that this always converges in one dimension or in the uh, in one dimension, <coughs> yeah, in one dimension, not in higher dimension. Um, so yeah, see, there are not so many theorems there. Um, but I don't want to get into the proof. I just want to say that what is different from maybe if there is something different, you know, and we can argue how different it is or whatever. But uh, is the nature of the proof? If you if if you look at the proof, the proof is an algorithm, and of course, people doing amortized analysis of algorithms are used to that, you know, where, but here it really uh, plays a role again and again in lots of these proofs where that if you're from the dynamical system uh, world, then you, you, you could think of it as a Lyapunov function that is distributed. So take a Lyapunov function and then just take all, <laughs> split up that amount of stuff that constitutes the value of the function and give it to all the agents. And, it's not a very good analogy because actually, from a physical standpoint, it's not a, a, a typically a Lyapunov function really represents a state function. It's a, it's a function, the typical, is a function of, you know, you have a point in phase space and that gives you a value of the Lyapunov function. That is not true here. The distribution of, so each agent is gonna have a bunch of credits and at any time, you cannot infer the distribution of credits from the position of the agents. It inherits the whole history. That's what makes the technique much more powerful than typical Lyapunov, because those systems typically have no energy. So you cannot look for some energy and say, I'm simply gonna follow a gradient. You cannot do that, okay? If so, not, you mean it's probably yeah, yes, yes. And, um, so it's a very modest result. Uh, and um, so what we do then, of course, is when you cannot solve a problem that seems very simple, then you make it more complicated. Uh, so that's what we'll do. But before I talk about this, so there's this conjecture by Blondel, Hendricks, and Tisticlis uh, from simulation, which says that, now let's go back to the old model, the standard model where you have 
you just move to the average of people within distance r, and then, uh, and then you see what happens. So if, if you draw pictures, uh, so I, now the, the time is on the right, so is horizontal axis, that's time, and on the left, I start with lots of points. There's so many of them, <coughs> it looks like a continuous distribution. These are like randomly placed agents, but there are tons of them. And then you just see how this evolves, and you have these very nice bifurcation things. But what they observed is that at the end, you have these clusters that have a uh, distance roughly 2R. That's this paper called the 2R conjecture, and that's what it claims through simulations. It's a, it's a strange paper because actually, it's not 2R. The simulation gives you 2.3R, but you can argue that is very close to 2, and so maybe 2 is a nice way of. Uh, now you can see that it cannot be too small because it, I mean, if you were to, to, I mean, when it freezes in the end, you have to, the points have to be outside their own influence, I mean, the influence of their friends. So if you're within distance r, then we'd be attracted. So that's not possible. Uh, but why two r? It could be why two point three r. That's even weirder. Uh, it could be just the simulation, you know, that's wrong. It could be there's a lot of fluctuation. I mean, who knows? So we worked on that, and. In one dimension. One dimension, OK? So one dimension is the only place to you can prove uh, convergence. No, in, in, in the general result, so I'll get to this later, this converges in any dimension. For, for the same r? Yeah, w when you have the same r. If you have different r, we don't know. Yeah, so now I consider the same r. Same R for everybody. And now I consider it in one dimension. Just one. So the 2R conjecture is really in one dimension. This is the dimension. OK? Um, so we quickly realized we couldn't prove that. Uh, <laughs> so we tried to make it simpler. A a and part of the, well, there are many reasons why. The most important is that we're not smart enough. But, uh, but this grid is very difficult in dynamical systems. Uh, the, and. Um, um, in particular because there are pathological cases. When, when there are all these symmetries and they're exactly the right size, there are all kinds of numbers. You don't want to have number theoretic considerations in here when somehow those things fall into some kind of right pattern. So you want to have a little bit of noise. And so what we did is say, well, add noise. So now we move over a stochastic differential equation setup where you just consider these particles instead of hopping to the mass center of their friends, they will just gradually crawl, crawl at certain you know, speed. And so it's a continuous uh, motion. And then you add some Brownian motion here. So this is a little Wiener process where you have a, uh, you know, so, so imagine the particle, each particle is pulled toward its friends at distance r. At the same time, it jiggles a little bit. Okay, so his own little entropy is, is just kind of jiggles. Um, so, for example, if it, if, if it were not pulled at all, if it only jiggles, then it's a diffusion process. That's, that's, that's simple. And now we couldn't prove anything about that, but we could draw interesting pictures. Uh, that shows a clear phase transition of, of what order, I don't know. I'll ask Tom about that. Uh, but these are just pictures, okay? There's no math in here. And, but if we take as an order parameter the graph density, so you know, there's a graph at any time, and so you just look at the number of edges, yeah, and that gives you a certain parameter, an order parameter, that you can try see whether those heat maps like this as a function of the noise and the R. Uh, now you see sigma and R pull in opposite directions. See, the bigger R is, the more you pull things together. The bigger sigma is, the more noise there is, and those things want to escape, okay? And, um, It's the heat, it, it's the order parameter, it's the graph density. So when, when R is big, the graph has more edges. That's, that's. So that's the final after being stable then? Oh, yeah, 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 no. The, this is at the end. Oh, okay. So we just let it go. Yeah, more edges, it's really a bunch of clicks. It's a bunch of clicks. It's a bunch of clicks. It's just the, the size yeah. of the cluster. Exactly. It's the size of the cluster, basically, yes. And yeah. this is two-dimensional? No, one dimension. I mean, the, the picture is two dimensional because oh, the two yeah, parameters, yeah. but it's one dimension. Yeah. And you 
have these nice little curves, you can see that you know when for a, a given R, the more noise you have, w when there's not so much noise, eventually over time, uh, then all those particles cluster together, and you have a nice sort of concentration Gaussian. And then uh, when the noise is bigger, the diffusion takes over. Ultimately, it's a uniform distribution. Yeah, there's some boundary condition I didn't talk about. We go modulo one. I mean, we just go around the thing. But uh, no, what, what? what? What is the modular condition? You, you yeah. The center of gravity yeah. is modular. No, the we no no no. When you hit, um, so it's on a circle, really. We do this on a circle. So it's <coughs> yeah, so it's yeah. Uh, yeah. So you yeah. go around. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very different than. Yeah, it is very it different. Is it well, that you have other points, I don't see why. I mean, no, it's not that different sense. because you have once you have noise, uh, simulation know, does not make much difference. Without noise. Oh yeah, it, it's a, noise, a big difference. Would it be yeah. That everybody will be yeah. So, yeah. Not everybody would be attracted to the same point, okay. but you would have. But yeah, that would make a much bigger difference. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so we couldn't prove anything. So finally, we made it even simpler. Um, and there we could prove something. So, so what you do now is you take the preceding thing and you take the thermodynamic limit, which is you take the number of agents go to infinity. So the hell with it. You know, this is discrete is too difficult. Okay, continuous is much easier. They've been doing this for three, since Newton, but but discrete we've been doing <coughs> it only since you know the last few years. So we don't know what we're doing. And so, so Garnier, Papa Nicolau, and those guys, this. They showed that the SDE that I just showed, if you do the obvious kind of modeling, and you, know, you take the average and the sort of mean field model, you end up with this PDE. So just make sure we understand what, what this means. So th there's an infinite number of agents or from zero to one. And so uh, what we measure now is a, de is a probability distribution. What is the probability of having somebody here and somebody there? So this is a probability distribution. It has to sum up to one. This is the derivative with respect to t. This is the derivative with respect to x. This is a diffusion term. So this is the noise. And so this is the diffusion constant, standard diffusion. Uh, you know, you, this is the heat equation right here. And here, it's the pooling things. It's, so that's the hard part. It's because this makes it very hard, because it's discrete. I mean, there's still something discrete there, which is within r, you, there's this big break. And so you get this. This is highly nonlinear, obviously, but there are techniques for dealing with things like this. So we prove two things. Uh, first, we show that this is well posed. And actually, this is quite this is, this took quite a bit of work uh, to show that. So Can you say what yeah, yeah, I will say yeah. So well posed simply means so you have this PDE, and you don't even know whether there's a, there's a solution. You don't even know whether there are many. So well posed means that uh, the solution exists, there's always a solution, it's unique, there's the only one, and it's non-negative. It is a probability distribution. Okay, so, so, and furthermore, it has all kind of regularity things, some smoothness assumptions you can, you can prove. So at least you're not, I mean, it means that well-posed, I think it's Adama who came up with that terminology. I mean, it basically says that if it's not well-posed, you're just barking up the wrong tree. I mean, this is just PDEs are useless. And you should only consider PDEs where there is a there's a unique solution. But OK, I'm, I'm not a PDE guy. So I'm not. But anyway, there we, there we could show, actually, mathematically, that it's 2.29. So it's very close to 2.3, which is what the simulation shows. Um, so that solves the problem of, you know, in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and we still don't have a clue how to do it in the discrete case. You yeah. start from an arbitrary uh, position. Yes. Uh, infinitely many particles. Well, they yes. Start, but they start at arbitrary. And, and this 2.29 yes. R happens no. regardless of the initial condition. No. No, you but start from the. OK, so you, you start from the random. <coughs> random? Yeah, yeah, from, from the random, random with fluctuations. Yeah, so yeah. No, not the movement, the initial. Yes, the, the, two R, the, the two R conjecture only applies to a, a random starting position. So because otherwise, I, if everybody's already clustered in one point, then there's no. So what is random? What, what distribution on the line is it? Oh, on the circle. On the circle, on yeah. The circle. Oh, yeah okay. um, so the technique goes like this. It's a perturbation method. And um, so here's what you do. You, 
you, you start from the uniform distribution, which is one. So just imagine that the diffusion overpowers the other dynamics so big that you end up with a, just a uniform distribution. So you start from this, and then you do a little perturbation, and, and you see what happens. So you add a Fourier wave. Uh, so you pick some mode k that you like, that somehow you think is nice, and, and then you postulate that there's a separation of variable. So you have these. Uh, this uh, wave that's modulated by PFT, and then you see what happens. So you do some work, and then you get an ODE like this, with this is this so weird function. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And we want to find rho. That, that's the goal. That's the function we want to integrate. Yeah. That that we want to know. And so um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. So. Anyway, so these are sort of standard techniques in PDE. So, so you play with that. And then you find that this is an ODE uh, that t uh, tells you, uh, that relates the time variation with this function over here, where S has to do with the mode and with the uh, radius. And then you argue that the final clustering will correspond to the most un unstable of, of these modes. And so because of the nature of this equation, then you want this to be as positive as possible, to be as unstable as possible. So if you draw these curves, these curves here, these curves here, then you find those things for different values what of is gamma. gamma. So we um, so gamma represents the noise. So what, what? Gamma represents the noise. If you are showing us this to us, you have to tell us how, what is this. Oh, okay. So, okay, you're happy with this, right? More or less. Okay, good. Then, if if you do some work from here, you get to here. This is an ODE. It's a you know ordinary differential equation that just tells you how P of T relates as a function of S, and S is a function of the mode K and R. Okay. And gamma, which appears here, so S is this. So S is depends on R and K. And gamma is the noise, is the diffusion term. Okay, So ultimately, we want set gamma to 0, because the 2R conjecture has to do with the no noise situation. So, But it's important to get the noise thing in order to get this <coughs> derivation. So basically, you look at all this, and you see gamma equals 0 is the blue thing. So you're going to argue that of all these waves, this is going to be the top because you want to maximize this. So this is going to be the top of the first, the first hill. You can show there cannot be the others. So anyway, so you do all this. And so this number, two, 229, is the solution, the, the, the smallest non-zero solution of when you make the derivative of this, zero. So it's highly transcendental. I mean, this is not a, it's not a number that, it's not a rational number or anything like this. Uh, OK, now when you, do this in higher dimensions. Uh, this always converges when the radius is the same. Okay. Now you can prove that. There are many people who've proved that. There are at least four or five different proofs of that. Um, but this follows a much more general result. I would like to talk about. I mean, I've warned you. This talk is going to be very quick over lots of things, and so it's a bit so impressionistic. So in your one-dimensional case, <coughs> you can't really do the picture scale. Yeah. So do you always start? Is it stable? Under any nice distribution from my initial condition? Yes. So let's go to the same. Yes. 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 But it has to be nice enough. Yes. Um, so now, change picture. OK. Um, consider an infinite set of uh, n by n <coughs> matrices, uh, stochastic, uh, st uh, stochastic matrices, and consider multiplying them. So this defines a dynamical system. You start with x0. It's a point in Rn. And, th and then you multiply those guys uh, to the left, towards the left. You see, usually in Markov chains, you, you multiply the other way, the other direction. But here you multiply from the left. So the vector is on the right. Okay, These are row stochastic metrics. All right? and, uh, and you want to prove things about this. Um, OK, so. So you may say from the left, you wish they don't deserve the other one now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they don't. And um, so these are, yeah. And, and then to study this, we introduce the kinetic S energy. So this is just a name, but this is the definition. So these 
defines orbits. So you start from x0, and then you have xt. So you have this curve, this, this uh, discrete curve in, in high dimension that goes on forever. And you can take every step o of that curve, and you take the distance, and, and you raise it to the power s, where s is a parameter. Okay, And then you, you take this over all times. And that's a number. It could be infinite. Actually, think about it. When s is equal to 0, you're summing 1 an infinite number of times. So you get infinity, obviously. So this function will have a singularity at 0. On the other hand, when s is equal to 1, you get the distance. So you get the length of the orbit, which could be infinite also. This is the length of the infinite orbit. Okay. And then there's everything in between. Now, for reasons we can discuss, this is the interesting case between 0 and 1, not bigger than 1. <coughs> and so I, sh I show some bounds on this thing for the type symmetric case. So the type symmetric case, this is when these matrices are type symmetric. So what does that mean? Well, type symmetric means that if you take all the non-zero entries and you turn them into 1, you get a symmetric matrix. Another way of looking at it is the fact that the zero locations are in symmetric position. So you know, if you take the matrix and it's transpose, the zeros will have exactly the same locations. But the other entries could be all shuffled. Okay? That's type symmetric. And um, you can check the hexagon Krauser is type symmetric. Um, are, you, are you any kind of independence of the, of the matrices? No. No, completely arbitrary. Right? So for, for example, the it could be the identity. So it could be an infinite product of the identity. So this thing never moves. Um, and so and rho is the smallest non-negative number. So in all these matrices, you have a, an alphabet of matrices, and you look at all them, and you look at the non-zeros, and you take the smallest value you've ever seen of the non-zero. Okay. See, for hexagon Krauser, it's 1 over n. Because you, you can never, no entry is going to be smaller than 1 over n. <coughs> so anyway, it's, um, and then you can prove these bounds. And then these bounds are, are extremely useful because you can derive convergence from these bounds directly. Now, I did this by doing standard combinatorial, just to kind of be obvious, I would say. But then I found out that if you interpret the S energy as a partition function, you can actually derive this by using Legendre transform argument that is totally standard, like this, what, what Tom does in his sleep before breakfast or something like that. And so it's funny to see these kind of different arguments actually are the same, but with different terminology. Uh, so, but that's just, uh, ju that's just a side comment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So oh, I should say, this is optimal for all. I mean, except the, I don't know the constant. But this is optimal for rho n. And this probably is not. This, is, this probably should be n, not n squared. And um, um, so just uh, to get some intuition, if rho is 1, that means that uh, the, the, the matrix is just a, a function, right? I mean, it's, the entries cannot be bigger than 1 because it's it's a stochastic, yes. And uh, I guess it's a permutation matrix. So in that case, if if s is one, if rho is one. oh oh if if rho is one, yeah 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 yes 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 it's the uh, yeah it's a permutation matrix yeah. So then it's, uh, no. Oh well, actually no, it's the identity because oh yeah I forgot to say you have to have the diagonal. The diagonal cannot be zero. So then it's that. Yeah the yeah. Diagonal cannot be yeah, zero yeah. because uh, that corresponds to your. Yeah, it's yes, exactly, exactly, yes. Now, since this is the mathematics building, not the physics building, th then I, I must mention that this is a Dirichlet series. That's the name that we give to this sort of thing. And you can think what happens when s is a complex number. Uh, and uh, so I drew this nice picture for the case n equals 2. And I want to know whether in the case of hexagon krauser you can have con <coughs> an analytic continuation of the S energy. Now, in general, that's impossible, obviously, but uh, because I mean, if it's arbitrary numbers, there's no way. But, but perhaps for hexagon krauser where everything <coughs> is very, very structured, maybe you can. And indeed, for n equals 2, uh, this uh, function in the complex plane has all these poles along the imaginary axis, infinite number of discrete uh, poles. and 
it'd be very interesting to know what happens for larger n. Now, this is a question that Nati Lino asked me, and um, I don't know the answer. But, and his argument was that it'd be very interesting, because if you had a result like this, and maybe you could find some functional equation, and if you have functional equations, then you could find all kinds of symmetries, inner symmetries of, of the dynamical system, which would be very interesting. Um, some intuition as to what is this function trying to do. Okay, if you have a stochastic matrix, uh, you can interpret this as a polytope. I mean, just look at the row, and that's a point in R4. So that gives you four points in R4. Take the convex hull, and that's a polytope. So with a matrix, now I have a convex polytope associated with it. And you can show the following nice geometric result, that when you have a stochastic matrix and another one, so you have two polytopes, and you multiply them, then you get another polytope that fits inside this one, actually fits inside. Uh, that's like Russian dolls. A a and the convergence, therefore, is implied by the fact that these, you have these nested polytopes, so I have to go somewhere by compactness, they have to. Um, so you get this thing, okay? And now remember, this is a generalization of Markov chains, because a Markov chain is just this, but with the same matrix. So this would be P cubed, P squared, and P. So you should be able to re-derive everything you know about Markov chain uh, through this thing. From the other yes, it's true. But on the other hand, you can argue that Markov chain is really understanding products of stochastic matrices. I mean, I mean the powers of stochastic matrices. So maybe it doesn't much matter whether you multiply from the left or the right at the end. Also, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, for as far as mixing is concerned, it's true. The mixing is just a statement about the, the power of a matrix. But you see, all, I shouldn't say all, but, but most previous techniques try to make a statement of how these shrinks from one in, at, at one step, in one step at a time. So like, like spectral gaps, for example, you know, will argue that some L2 average of measuring something in the polytope shrinks but at least something that's a function of the spectral gap and, and so on. And whereas the S energy is a completely orthogonal view, which is that for any value of S, so it's like a temperature in that sense, or inverse temperature. For any value of S, this is an integral. This is a sum over the entire orbit, the entire trajectory. And this is very important because since these matrices are arbitrary, you could have the identity for a long, long time, you just keep multiplying the identity, and there's no progress. Because when you multiply by the identity, you, you get stuck, and nothing shrinks. So these uh, the spectral techniques cannot possibly work. But here it doesn't matter, because you just simply integrate over the entire thing. Um, OK. Um, now, Hexham and Krauser in higher dimension, uh, as I said, when we have the same r, OK, I changed. This is low r. It doesn't matter. Uh, this converges, so there's a fixed point attractor. If you have an annulus in two dimensions, then you, you could have limit cycles. It's easy to engineer a situation where actually you start having limit cycles when you have an annulus. So you can ask, well, what if you have arbitrary shapes? In particular, this induces a geometric graph, and we know a lot about geometric graphs, and in particular, people who work in robotics, for example, they they love this graph, constraint delineate triangulation. I don't need to define what it is. It just looks very pretty. And, but you realize that to define whether these two agents should have an edge between them requires a logical sentence that has quantifi uh, quantifiers. It's like there exists a center such that, and a radius such that all the points that are on the surface are blah, 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 blah. So it's a logical sentence. It's not just a circle that tells you you should be within distance r. Of IV, so <coughs> it's um, so. As I say, since we're having, I want to ask you about the first, uh, yeah, in the, in the, the fixed points for, for the fixed radius. Yeah, so there must be many fixed points. Yeah, so yes. I mean, do you have any classification of them, or is it just too big? No. So this is the this is that that diagram that that it was showing, where you start having these. From, you go from two dimensional to one dimension to, to zero dimension. No, we don't know much about it. Yeah, no, we don't. Um, Is there any similar conjecture like the 2.29 thing? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure there is such a conjecture, but uh, this is totally beyond our. I mean, it's very easy to answer any question because pretty much the answer is I don't know. I mean, <laughs> so, and uh, um, 
So since I don't know how to solve the easy problem, I'm going to attack the hard ones. Seems to be the right thing. And so forget about circles and radii. Let's just be really, really like computer scientists. We just simply say, well, this is all about language anyway. And so we, we're going to say that um, there's an edge between this guy and this guy, if and only if some first order sentence over the reals is true. So now your stochastic matrix, each entry will have its own sentence that will be true or false depending on the value of x. Depending, depending on the placement of the agents, this entry will be 0 or it will be a positive number. And, and I allow every entry to have a different sentence. I don't require, this is important, like for example, uh, think of the case of uh, radii, when the radii are different. It means agents have different formula. But these are just formulas uh, to say that you are within distance r is a quadratic equation inequality. So is, there's no quantification here. I want to allow arbitrary quantification to be totally general. But now, now these are not time dependent. These are yeah, no, 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 very important. No, no, these are fixed. This is not time dependence. So ahead of time, you fix, you, you fix these rules. So these are your, your rules, yes. So you can have an annulus, or you can have you know, things like that. But they're fixed, yes. And, um, so, and the dynamic is the same. You move to the mass center of the neighbors, and, and you update the graph, and you repeat forever and see what happens. Um, so you, you can play with this and see that by concocting different sentences, logical sentences, you get interesting behavior. I mean, in fact, you get something that can be uh, Turing complete. So even with stochastic matrices. And so, so it means you have all of dynamical system theory right there if you look at it carefully enough. Um, but what I showed is under some technical assumptions, which I will not talk about here, if you perturb the system, then with probability one, uh, you will have a periodic attractor. You will have limit cycles. This and smooth, uh, yeah, it, it's a smooth analysis. Yeah. Exactly, that would be the the closest uh, in spirit. That's exactly what it is. Um, except I do have technical assumptions, which are I wish I could remove, but, but I can't. This is universal over the, the choice of, uh, of first order sentence. Yeah. Yes, and now even when it's like this, you can have. So this is the biggest difference with Markov chains. I mean, think of these systems as generalizing Markov chains where the matrices are different. I mean, that's a fair. But you see, Markov chains has only one times, has like two time scales. You can be polynomial or you can be exponential. I mean, after the exponential amount of time, Markov chain will tell you what's going on. You don't have to wait any further. But that's not true here. You can have clocks that, are, that have huge period and they are robust. This is an important thing because when something is turning complete or even chaotic, you can have any period you want because chaotic means that the, the clock is infinite, the period is infinite. So maybe that's not impressive, but these are not robust. If you shake them a little bit, the whole uh, period just dies. Whereas these, these are robust constructions where you have these, all these time scales. Uh, and what's happening is the emergence of long-term memory. So I have this little cartoon here. Maybe you won't like it, but I like it. So uh, you'll have to suffer through it. And uh, it's that remember, you know, I mean, without getting into dynamical system theory and so on, but the intuition of a limit cycle is that the, the, the system loses memory. We see the agents completely forget where they, where, where they come from. Uh, and conversely, uh, as long if you can define some memory, in the system. And as long as somebody you can show still has memory, you know you have not reached a limit cycle. And so here's con consider what happens. Suppose the situation where this guy stays put, and the others start going around and finally stabilize into a limit cycle after a long time. And that limit cycle has period t. Now you can show that it's possible that just before this thing completely settles, remember it's not a periodic orbit. It is an asymptote. It's a limit cycle. So it goes closer and closer. So it still moves. And you can imagine like epsilon before it goes to the actual periodic orbit, which it never reaches. But the first order sentence of this guy decides to talk to her, I mean to listen to her. Okay, just decide to have an edge right now because, 
where we'll, we'll talk about how the, 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 the resolution of first order sentences, I, I'll talk about this. Like, like how close, I mean there's a gap, how close can you get before I it's too late and your sentence simply ha is always true or al always false. So we'll talk about this. But, but so you can show that there's a memory loss of two to the minus c t, it's exponential. Which means that you can repeat this an exponential number of times, exponential in t, before this guy loses memory. Whoa. Because it starts with like a finite amount of memory, okay? I, d I don't want to be formal because otherwise no, I, it takes forever, okay, but. Omar, what does memory mean? Memory is the, your coordinates when you start. So you start the game at x, y in two dimensions, say. Eh? So, so that's your coordinates and that's your memory. So think of this, say, over bits, a bit representation, we have so many bits. And then when you're stuck in the limit cycle, all that information will be gone, completely gone. And the question is, as you go, you start losing bits, you lose information. It's like in the movie, uh, you know, it's HAL in the Odyssey, Space Odyssey. And um, so you can show that the memory loss is exponentially small, which means you can repeat this exponential number of times, and then you can recurse through each of the agents which will give you this behavior. And that gives you this clock, this robust clock of enormous time scale. So you see, you can create time scales which you cannot otherwise. Um, this is even true if you have diffusion. How much diffusion can you tolerate? Can you error correct? No, I suspect, so I don't know, but I suspect that's not true. That if you have diffusion, uh, this will not happen. And then alternatively, if you replace the circle with a Gaussian kernel, it would probably yeah, it probably uh, probably doesn't change much. Yeah. So you so you can even have this behavior with a Gaussian kernel instead of the yes, the big clock probably. Oh uh, no, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No, no, I'm not sure. So actually, that ties into the next thing. So maybe. Um, so this is a dynamical system. It's a function that goes from here. You, you can assume that d equals 1. Uh, it doesn't really change that. I mean, it changes nothing, actually. And uh, so you, you think about it as a, a dynamical system where the map goes like this. It's px times x. This is a vector. And this is a stochastic matrix that depends on, on the vector. And each entry is decided by a first order sentence. And first order sentences are nice because by Tarski and Collins, we know that there's a, uh, th that you can uh, algebraize the entire thing. And so it basically becomes a system like this, that in phase space, Rn, uh, x is a point or a vector, whatever, somewhere. And then space is nicely partitioned by these algebraic uh, you know, varieties. And, and each chamber, think of it like this, each cell has a stochastic matrix, which is the same for the entire cell. And when this sits here, it just looks up the stochastic matrix and it just goes you know, to there. And here it looks it up and it goes. So it's a piecewise linear system with these funny, this funny surfaces. OK. And this goes on forever. Now, some intuition, again, since that's really what this is all about, uh, some intuition about what, why is it hard to analyze this? And there's only one reason why it's hard is instead of a point, take a ball, maybe a ball that fits in here, and then just you know, follow what happens. And it's going to be hard when the ball cuts across the wall. You know, if the ball were to fall nicely inside each chamber, uh, then things would be easy. But at some point, it's likely that they will hit the wall. And they, they will split. One will go this way, and one will go that way. Okay? You see, like, for example, if this guy falls here, the, now there's two, two stochastic matrices, and one half goes over here, and one half goes over there. So you have this, uh, like, nuclear fission or something. It just starts, okay? And um, so, for example, if you have a ball, and then <coughs> it cuts through the walls, then you have like three balls now yeah, as the, and then maybe this repeats. And you can show that uh, a limit cycle really means that the population stops growing. At some point, and chaos is basically when the population never stops growing. Yeah, th these balls, these eggs, whatever. Yeah, at some point, 
nobody ever hits a wall. Th that's if and only if the system is asymptotically periodic. Okay, this is a very nice property. It's kind of intuitive because then you have, then it becomes like a finite state machine. You know, once you stop cutting the wall, there's a finite thing and you just simply start going around that. Uh, but um, now, think of these children as being thrown randomly, which is really not a bad thing to think of. Uh, and you have a bunch of walls, and you ask, well, what's the chance that the ball that I throw actually falls across the wall? Not touches the wall. I mean, that's kind of stupid. I mean, it, it lands like this on this side of the room and this on that side. What's the chance? Well, you say, well, it's probably has got to do with the volume of the ball. If it's a big ball, it's more likely than a, a tiny one. If it's a point, it's, there's no way it's going to be on the wall. So you can say that the splits, maybe if you throw a ball at random, the probability of the hit is roughly the volume of the ball. It's not quite right, but let's pretend for the time being that it's OK. Uh, but then if you go back to what I was saying, then you have now a competition that the balls are going to be shrinking. And we'll talk about this later. So the balls are shrinking, but they multiply. And they're thrown randomly. So think of this as a probabilistic game. You're in some space, and then you have these walls, I mean these surfaces. And then you start with one ball, and you throw it at random. And if it lands across a wall, it splits into two. And then you throw it again. But every time it does that, it shrinks. It actually shrinks, because the determinant of a stochastic matrix is less than one. So the volume will shrink. But uh, on the other hand, if it's random, it's going to hit walls. Now, you, uh, what's the chance that at some point it will not hit any wall? There will be some time t at which all these balls are being thrown, and, but none of them touches the wall. Well, it, it's a competition between the shrinking rate and you know, the number of walls that you have. There's going to be obviously, and so it's the competition between the sort of entropy of the system and the energy, OK? So because the spectrum of the matrices, you know, except for this annoying eigenvalue 1, which is a real, real nuisance, um, you know, these are contractive maps. So that gives you some kind of energetic minimization process where things want to shrink. This is like being pulled. You know, this is R. When you're being pulled together, the averaging is a contracting map. OK, so, so that's good. It means that these guys shrink. On the other hand, uh, this piecewise linear thing acts kind of randomly, okay, and that creates deterministic randomness, if you will. I mean, it's all deterministic, but yet it behaves as though it was like a quasi-random, uh, pseudo-random number thing. So there's this entropy, and in dynamical system, you can define the topological entropy, even though these are deterministic systems, you can define this very well, and that captures these kind of pseudo-random. Anyways, it's a competition, okay, and this has to win in order to have an attracting uh, limit cycle, OK? The, the problem is what I said was wrong. The, um, it's not the volume. When you have a football, uh, it's not, the volume has nothing to do with the probability of hitting a wall. It's the diameter. That's really what matters, is the diameter, OK? A stick is just as bad, has no volume, but it's a terrible thing. There's a likelihood of hitting the wall. And that is really, really bad news, because the diameter does not shrink. The diameter of a polytope under stochastic matrix does not shrink. Uh, it's always the same, in fact, because the eigenspace for eigenvalue 1 has at least 1, 1, 1, 1 as a vector, probably more, but has at least 1. And, and along that axis, there's no shrinking at all. Okay? And so, so, so this is where it becomes kind of tricky, because you've got to factor out the eigenspace for 1, the dominant eigenspace, and then hope that the rest will drag you and, OK? And this is where you basically have to abandon linear algebra. Pretty much everything there has to change. And you have to really measure information flows across time-varying networks. And perhaps the best illustrate this, we can look at what happens in the case of a Markov chain. So I, again, a Markov chain, except for the fact that we multiply from the left and not from the right, is, is really when all these matrices are the same. And then, so you have a graph that gives you a Markov chain. And when the graph is fixed, every vertex moves to the mass center. 
Now, I can draw a picture that tell you what happens in something like this. Uh, you know, one, two, four will shrink together, uh, and then five, seven, eight, and three, eight, and six. And, and if you know, if you remember your Markov chain, uh, you know, theory, uh, th then you will recognize these. These are the co uh, communicating classes. Uh, you know, you can, you can classify those Markov chain graphs in, in here into four parts. Uh, these are the, you mean the strong reconnaissance. Yeah, exactly. The strong reconnaissance components in two varieties. There are those that once you enter, you're stuck. You can never leave. So these are irreducible. And those guys basically ultimately uh, drag you there. So the, the, the two guys. And, and the, this three here is the dimension of your eigenspace, of, of, of your dominant eigenspace. So here, the dominant eigenspace has, has dimension three. OK? And, um, and that is what you need to factor out. So you need to look at the system where this is fixed. And then you kind of look at the dynamics over here. I mean, you can even think of this as a system of spring, where this will contract and then finally nail to the ground, nail to the ground. And then this guy has springs pulling in various ways. And, th and this might oscillate. This is where you get those long period, because this might be going in all kinds of crazy ways. But this is just for the case of one graph. You understand, what we're trying to do is every step this graph changes, so the classification changes. So you cannot just repeat the classification at each step. The whole thing would be incoherent. So, but anyway, the point is that Markov chain theory, in the case of one thing, yields a suitable renormalization, which is the key word here. Because to analyze the dynamics, it's very important that this graph be understood as consisting of three parts plus something in the middle. And this is renormalization, OK? You can have a very, very complex graph. At the end of the day, there are only three things that count. There are three groups that count, three clusters. And, and what the dynamic within the thing is irrelevant, OK? <laughs> I mean, it's not irrelevant, but it's very easy to analyze. So how do you generalize this when you have an infinite sequence of graphs, OK? And so this is, I'm going to talk about a message passing mechanism that will allow you to parse an infinite sequence of graphs in order to do this renormalization and generalize what we just did for Markov chain. Okay? So think of an infinite sequence of graphs. Maybe I should write it the other way because it's really going to the left. But, but think of this as a word in some, with some grammar. We have some grammar, and we want to parse it. If you're a computer scientist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe if you're not, I'm not sure if parsing means something. But uh, it's like, you know, program, you know, what a compiler does. Um, so, so, so think about this. You know, there are all these um, graphs on the same number, the same set of vertices, of labeled vertices. And they're going to be the leaves of a tree. And somehow, this will be the parse tree, OK? And yeah, then the semantics, you, you take the first step in the first graph, and then the second yeah. step in the second graph. Yeah. Third steps, yeah. So you have a different graph. I mean, it could be the same graph, but yes. And um, so there's a grammar, and I don't have time or to go through. But just imagine there's a grammar that you can define. Th these are rewriting rules, okay? And and before I explain a little bit how this works, let me just briefly tell tell you wh why are we doing this? Well, wh where is this going? What is the point? So here's the point: to analyze these, these dynamical systems, you have to analyze the space of orbits. Uh, see, this is something that we in algorithms have, uh, I mean, we're lucky because in algorithms we don't have that problem. Usually w you study the worst case or maybe the average or something like this. But if you want to prove that something has a limit cycle, if you just focus on one orbit, you, that, that will get you nowhere. Because one orbit means nothing. I mean, it's not because an orbit starts going uh, very close to itself uh, for a long, long time that it's a limit cycle. What do you know? Maybe you know, 100 years is going to decide to go <laughs> somewhere else. Okay? So the only thing you can do is not follow an orbit, but follow the space of all orbits. So you take phase space, and then you take the transform and the transform. That's the object that you need to understand. And the bifurcation will take place there. But this is a complicated thing. And so what we want to do is be able to rewrite it in terms of tensor products. And there are two basic kinds of tensor products. And I won't get into details. The first one is very intuitive. It's the fact that when you have two dynamical systems that are decoupled, then in phase space, the joint dynamical systems is the direct sum of the two. That's kind of obvious. Okay? 
And there's another class of tensor products, which is composition, which is what happens when you have a dynamical system evolving, and then part of it decides to switch to another dynamical system. So now you have the composition of two dynamical systems, and that's a direct product, or you can define that, and so on. So once you parse this thing, then you can go into rewriting your space of orbits, and now you can look at each part and kind of homomorphically apply these rules to see how the topological entropy evolves. And this competition between energy and entropy can be followed line by line here. So that's the, that's the grand goal. OK. Uh, what, what are the yeah. yeah, sorry. I don't understand what these spaces are. OK, the space of orbits, right? So a, a, an orbit is. So are we, are the, is I mean, what are we tensor product? Are we taking, is it a tensor product or a Cartesian product? Or? OK, so there are two kinds. Yeah, so one is really a Cartesian product when you have a direct sum. So, so you have two dynamical systems that are completely decoupled. OK? Maybe one is in two dimensions and the other is in three dimensions. And you can consider the dynamical system formed by the union of, now you have five dimensions. That can be expressed as a direct sum of the two. It's a Cartesian product because all possibilities in, in the space of orbits is, is, is possible, yeah? And the other one is a bit more complicated, so I will. OK. But since I have like five minutes left, no? Five minutes left? Uh, no? No, <laughs> no I, I see the no, thing sorry, you no, got. Don't worry about it. So, uh, well, in, in the story, so you are just, uh, I mean, in some sense, I think you are trying to explain to us how the proof goes, that uh, yeah. this smooth analysis actually tells you that uh, yeah, in most cases you get, I mean, after perturbation, you get only you know, limit cycles or fixed points. Yes. I'm not, I'm not sure I follow the explanation, but can you say well in the, this explanation, do you ever use the fact that these were first order sentences? Yes. This piecewise linearity is yes. what says, yeah. Right, so it's the fact that you have these beautiful algebraic surfaces, and, and they form like rooms, and each room has its own stochastic matrix, and therefore the system is piecewise linear. That, that's where the first sentence is used, yeah, and you can have bounds on the number of varieties and so on. Yeah, th that's that's where it's used. So is this a general? S s I mean, is this falls into the structure of piecewise linear dynamics. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, but but here's the main point, the philosophical point, which is that ultimately what I'm trying to argue is that if you want to understand the dynamics of the systems. Don't think in terms of the dynamics. It, ultimately, it's a problem of information passing across a graph that change, a network that changes over time. Following how the information crosses is what matters. Now, now you can argue, by the way, when you study mixing, any proof of any mixing of, any, of anything can be interpreted as a message passing where you're simply counting the number of paths and all the messages that go, whether many pass very quickly or perhaps not quickly. I mean, all these isoparametric inequality can be reinterpreted as bottlenecks for information passing. But the reason why it's more useful to do it this way is because the graph changes. And when the graph changes, the standard counting paths become meaningless. Kind of what, what's the path now that you know, the graphs are changing? And so, so basically, even if you don't care about these influence systems, I mean, these particular dynamics, dynamical systems, what I'm trying to get at is a very general renormalization scheme for dynamic networks. When you have something dynamics that happens because of networks that change. So it, it, I argue if the network does not change, that is a solved problem as far as I'm concerned. That's pre pretty much Markov chain thing, so that's, you know, people have done it. Now when the graph changes, then argue number one that everything changes. I mean, pretty much the old theory is useless because linear algebra doesn't work. And um, now you have to go and do renormalization. So you, 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 you have to go and, and interpret this sequence of networks as sub, sub, you know, parts, subgroups of graphs where information goes and so on. I had a picture, 
I don't have it here, but this is a picture where I have, um, if, if you do like, think of a graph like a soccer match. Okay, think of a soccer match, I, mean, I know, you know, soccer, it's a, you go like 22 players, and then, uh, so when they start, uh, okay, no, you, you know, the start of the thing, there's the ball in the middle, there's these, these two guys, and then there's like all, all the others waiting for action, okay? And imagine what they look at, what the players look at. And then the, as the match evolves, when the, when the ball is very near the goal, uh, then the players look at different things. Now, so you, you have this graph. At every time, you can draw this director graph, which is who is looking at who, or who is trying to tackle whom, and so on. I argue that good soccer players can renormalize this sequence. That's what makes them good soccer players, because they can read. You know, see, you want to be able to read this interaction of 22 agents in a way that semantically makes sense. Uh, so for example, you know, who you're supposed to mark when the ball is near the goal and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so the sequence of graphs is not just a sequence of graphs. You can actually take the sequence of graphs and draw blobs around the sub parts of the graph that make sense, semantically make sense to understand the game. So that's basically the sort of thing we're trying to do. We're trying to do a decomposition of the graphs into parts that make sense as far as the semantics of the, the dynamics go. So for example, if your dynamics is Markov chain, then we know these are the communicating classes, the, 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 strongly, connected, the strongly connected things. That is the right renormalization of the graph. We know that. But we don't know when it's uh, so. Um, OK, I have two minutes left. So maybe I'll just, if you have two minutes, I, I, I just want to quit this and maybe just go and show you um, just two minutes on iterated learning, because th uh, this is really fun. It's about equilibrium. So everything here it really is about how to avoid equilibrium. And so, so OK, so l let me just quickly uh, talk about the curse of equilibrium. Okay, so, you know, we, there's a prejudice we have, computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists, that rapid mixing is good, slow mixing is bad. And if you're not convinced of this, look at the terminology. We don't say slow mixing, we call it torpid. I mean, torpid it means somebody who's mentally inactive. I mean, this is really an insulting, uh, an insult. So, you know what the preference is, uh, but in biology, it's the opposite. This, this means death, and this means you can live a long, happy life. So, so we need to understand, you know, diffusion, percolation, these are all about mixing, and we want this to happen, you know, fast. You want your coffee to be ready soon. You don't want to wait two hours. Um, but all stories about equilibrium. Now, in living matter, equilibrium means death. So here's something I did with Chu, my former student, which is kind of fun. It took me just two minutes to tell you what it is. So there's this old experiment, 1932, uh, psychologist Bartlett had this experiment. He had an owl, and then he, had, he would have these art students, I, I assume they were art students, and then he would show the owl to the first student for one minute. And then he would yank the picture out, and he would ask, please draw what you saw. So you, you would draw what you saw. You, you, you can take 20 minutes if you want. And then you would leave the room. And then I, I would get the second uh, student who has not seen anything. So, you know, Ronnie is brought in from the outside and is shown Alvis picture. And you have one minute to look at it. Then we hide it. And now we want you to draw what you just saw. And we keep on doing this. And <laughs> after 20 steps, you get a cat. Okay, I mean, this is, these are the pictures from the 1932 papers. And so you start with an owl, and you get a cat. It always works. This is always why. Why, see, the people cannot learn. See, you try to teach the concept of an owl, but you do it through iteration. You don't do it like broadcast. Here's an owl, people join. You do it one at a time, so there's some error. But there's a bias, obviously. There's a prior that people like cats better than owls. I don't know. You, okay, I'm not a psychologist, so you know, that's where. But, but you, you start. Uh, well, all people cannot draw, and so if, if it were me, I would draw this, and you would say, well, what is this? <laughs> so you probably have to have some drawing ability. Um, now, so these people, it's very hard to measure anything like this. You just look at this picture and you say, why? But then what else can you do? It's very hard to do science. Uh, so then these 
people recently redid the same thing <laughs> with lines going down. So they will draw a cloud of lines going down, OK? Uh, x plus y equals 1 or something like that. So this is going down. And then we play the same game. And after nine iterations, <laughs> the lines are all going up. You see, we have a bias toward positive. We think positively. We don't like things going down. Like, you know, you've noticed, maybe you have not noticed, but in the United States, you will never see a road sign with an airplane going down. You will see plenty of road signs with airplanes, but they're always going up. They're taking off. But, uh, but I mean, they're taking off as often as, as they're landing. And so they should be half and half. But that's not true. And um, so what we showed is that, so see, what happens is if you interpret this in a Bayesian model, then th this process is a form of Gibbs sampling. And you're basically mixing to your prior, which means that you have a prior. And wherever you start from, <coughs> then ultimately <laughs> you lose information about what you start learning and then you get uh, absorbed by your prior that takes over because that's the only stationary distribution. Now these people were not interested in lies, they're interested in, um, in language actually. So these are psycholinguists and they're trying to, uh, psycholinguist is a terrible word, I, I shouldn't say that. They're not psycholinguists, <laughs> <laughs> they are psycholinguists, okay? <laughs> and, and they have this theory that how come we can learn languages from generation to generation? You know, and the, 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 this theory that this is by complexity uh, theory that that, uh, that language has evolved so that it's easy to learn, and therefore you know the, it's a complexity theory argument why, uh, which is different from the uh, so the Chomsky argument. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but the problem with language is it's, it's impossible to, uh, I mean, I feel sorry for these people. It's impossible to experiment. I mean, how do you experiment ch children learning languages over 10 generations? <laughs> this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so yeah, so what we showed is that if you, so you know, you, you have something like this, but so the idea is that if you learn the same amount of bits every time, then you will decay and you, you will mix to the, to the stationary distribution, which is your prior. But we show that by increasing the learning, so basically you're increasing the time of exposure to the picture or to the language. So let's say you're trying to learn a uh, foreign language and you, you, take, you, know, you, you study for two months. Then you teach it to somebody, but then you have to teach it for three months. And then that person teaches somebody else for four months. So if, if you increase the thing, then we can maintain the initial data uh, basically unchanged. So it's self-sustaining. So, but anyway, I don't have time to go through this. But it's, it's a small increase. It's a logarithmic increase. So th this would be a Markov chain where you start doing a random walk, but you do not want to mix. And so what you do is you locally change the Markov chain very, not radically, well, of course, if you cut off all, all your neighbors, then you, you, you're stuck in there. But uh, you chain it very, very smoothly so that it never mixes, never. In fact, you never go epsilon away from the distribution where you started from. And that's the kind of thing. Anyway, I didn't realize I would need more time. But um, maybe it's good, because you ask questions. So that's, that's uh, more fun. So maybe I'll just stop here. <laughs>